everyone to the second semi-final of Worlds 2023 live from the Sajik Indoor Gymnasium in Busan, South Korea. Today we are poised for what might be one of the most exciting series in Worlds history as hometown heroes T1 are defending the honor of the LCK against the LPL superstars on the Golden Road, JDG. As we see our gladiators entering the arena today, first JDG followed by T1, led by, of course, Faker. Who else? Into this historical, monumental day at the World Championship where one of these roads will end today and one will go on to play in the World Final next week. My name is Shox and I'm joined here by Emily, Dagda and Azale. And can I just tell you, we, we've been so giddy oh. the whole day because of this matchup. How can you not be excited about this matchup? It's it's so insane. The fact that we get this to the semifinals is just cheating. This is such a crazy matchup. It's what? crazy. And it's everything from narrative to actual, like, analytical gameplay, right? Like, this has it at every single level. It it's has be... everything. Ah, ah. Uh, who's waiting in the final, you ask? Well, it's Weibo. <laughs> Azale, yesterday, they set aside BLG in five games. Yeah, able to take down BLG. No one expected them to get nearly this far. Everyone was calling them frauds, thinking that they made the easiest run ever to semis. They're going to get crushed by BLG, but Weibo waiting in the finals. Guaranteed a top two spot of Worlds. Yes, and if you've missed any of the action in the Worlds knockout stage so far, you can go ahead and head over to youtube.com slash gaming to check everything out, the VODs and the highlights, if you've missed it, because it was a long one yesterday. But I hope you're prepped and primed for today. And to set us up for this epic LPL versus LCK clash, Azale once again has prepared something for us. Oh I've prepared a little <laughs> bit of a quiz. <laughs> okay. And so we're, we're just going to kick it off. We're going to start it off. It's going to be LPL versus LCK. So okay, the theme. last okay. time you quizzed me, it was bad because it was. I'm pretty sure you win every quiz, reliving Emily. Reliving all of the KG Stop rosters. the self-hate. You're great at this. All right, question number one. All right, you're fine. Out of, out I got of my all flag. these players, who has the most combined wins in world's history? So you're adding up all of the players in each of these answers to get who has the most combined wins in world's history. Oh my God! Raise your flag when you want to answer. Shocks. Faker. You are correct! Yay! Yes. Baker has more than any of these other combinations. 90 wins at Worlds. Actually insane, has more than entire teams. That's crazy. Have, have achieved in that their That was careers. such a freebie, but I, mean, I was like, it can't be that easy. I, some of them are going to be hard. The, 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 the only one I hesitated Better on watch was the ruler, the ruler 369. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's surprising. All right, question number two. At the World 2017 group stage, T1 overcame a 10,000 gold deficit versus EDG in one of the biggest Wombo Combo team fights in league history. Name the five T1 players and their champions in that game. This is and their Baker's champions? Shockwave. Oh. We'll claim them all. I'll give you one no, point. I, I I'll give you one that. point if you get the players and an extra point if you get Oh no. <laughs> I was just gonna say one player faker. <laughs> I thought I'd get a point. <laughs> yeah, Oriana. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Faker, yeah. Oriana. Wait, I can't yes. even remember who the top lane was in that game. This is so hard. It's hard. To be it's fair, hard. I don't remember anything T that happened T1's last year. T1's roster years. also changes it... all the time. Marin? No. Was it? No. 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 Wait, that was uh, 2015, Rumble, right? Was. Yeah, that was 2015. That's 2015. Now realize, yeah. Nope. Shoot. Okay. Who, who, who needs Why are we choking who so needs, hard? Who I know, we're, saying. we're choking insanely hard. No. Okay, okay, here. I'll, how about this? I'll, I'll give you the players, and then okay. you can try to guess the champion. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Okay. Wait. Oh. Wolf. Yeah. Shots. It, that is one, yes. Um, it's um, Wolf. Um, <laughs> Emily, last chance. Uh, and then we're going to go was, to the SRT. So, Peanut, Faker, Wolf, Bang, Pony. Yes. Oh, okay, Hooney. we're going to give you a point. And we can, now we have a clip of it. We're going to roll, and you guys can see this. So you can see what champions it was. One of the most iconic plays we've ever this seen. This is so crazy. I that, remember yeah. the Oriana. That's, that's it. <laughs> yeah. I'm the Rakan. I remember oh Wolf's Rakan. Oh, my yes. And that was yeah. it. I totally did forget that Hootie was playing Choga. Yeah. It's I so crazy. I just, oh, Rumble was on the other team. That's yeah. why I had Rumble. Yeah, okay. I, I have such a hard time with, and I think this is a good talking point for today in terms of SKC T1 rosters. This is what you get for saying too easy yeah. for yeah. question yeah. number one, Shox. That'll teach if, you. If it's All right, is it work for me? I'm question number three. Settle down, settle down. Flag. Question number three. When was the last <laughs> LCK versus LPL World Finals, and what was the final score? Oh. Shox. Uh, EDG versus Damwon. 20, uh, 21. Yes, yes. And the final score was 3-2 to EDG. Oh, let's go! Smoked us! Oh. Shocked us! Well, I 
Well, I was the only person of the broadcast team there. She's the GOAT, okay. Next and question. I knew it, but did not get my flag up in time. Well, that's half the battle. It's mechanics it's and brain, just like League of Legends. I don't have hands. Okay, question number four. Okay, that was too easy. Now, when was the last time that T1 faced an LPL team in the World Finals? And what was the score? Oh, um... RNG SKT 2013, 3-2. <gasps> you got everything except the score. Shit. <laughs> Wait. Yeah. Well, 20. Yeah. No, no RNG oh. SKT. But it's 3-1. It was 3-1. No. no, it was 3 0. Oh, fuck. It was 3 0. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> I, uh, I this, kept thinking. This is their cold royal club, but I'll give, I'll give yeah. you RNG. I one point just for. No! I need a point! <laughs> Emily need gets one. it. We're going to keep moving on. This is so insane. I know. Next question. Out of all the players in tonight's series, who has the best win rate in LCK versus LPL matchups at Worlds? Emily. <laughs> uh, of these, I'm actually going to say owner. Wrong. <laughs> uh, I think I think shocks. Faker. Wrong. Oh. Uh, damn. Okay. Uh, we're <laughs> no. oh, oh, no. say it. Say it. <laughs> yes, you're yeah. correct. Zayas. I got a point. Zayas. Zayas. Oh. Thirteen and one in LCK versus LPL matchup. The 92.9 percent win rate. Owner wow. and Guma both played a game with Kana where they lost against EDG. So that was the difference. So Dagda, was, yeah. you're on the board, my man. <laughs> Nailed it. All right, next question. <laughs> We're going to use the whiteboard for this one so you guys okay. can write down oh, your God. answer. There's, okay. there's only two possible choices. So, which of the two regions has won more LCK versus LPL knockout stage BO5s in world's history? So the answer, obviously, LCK or LPL. Write down your answer. We'll all reveal it at the same time as soon as you guys are ready. I feel like it... Get to writing, get to writing. The clock's ticking here. Keep it moving, people. Is everyone ready? Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, one, two, three, reveal. LPL, LCK. Okay, Dagda, you are unfortunately incorrect. Damn it! I it is 11 <laughs> to 7 yeah. for the LCK. And T1 has won six of those 11. So if T1 wins wow. today, they will have won as many as the entire LPL has against the LCK, because that would be lucky number Woo, seven we have, for, we have for them. Put that uh, full screen up a Docs. million times already during the show. And Emily, I know. There I know. you go. I just got to be LPL today, All right? right? Yeah. <laughs> number seven. Of the mid laners left in the tournament, who has the most LeBlanc games in world's history? Bonus points if you know how many. Is it Faker, Shahu, Knight, or Yagao? This Ugh. is one of those things where it's like, are you trolling me? Because there's a very obvious Shocks. answer. Oh. Faker. <laughs> okay. Uh, Shahu. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Shahu <laughs> has, yeah. has two games of, of LeBlanc Wait, you were World. supposed to guess. How oh, many? You, you raised this flag. Well, no, no. that's okay. We can <laughs> go. Yeah. We need to keep this moving. We're going to give you a point. We're going to keep it moving. Congratulations. I feel like we're all Faker has down. one, Shaho has two. Everyone else has zero, surprisingly enough. Um, on screen, we're going to see a, a famous moment in league history. But we've got oh a bunch God. of tiles on it, okay? As we slowly remove the tiles, when is this moment and what is happening? Raise your flag as soon as you think you can answer. This is a famous moment. You will all know this moment. I guarantee it. All the fans at home, if you've been watching you're, for a while, you're going to know You're it talking too. to the people that forgot the T1 lineup. Yeah. That you are going to know <laughs> this moment. It's not It's not as difficult as that. Let's start revealing. Right, right. Reveal, okay, reveal. Okay. We'll keep going. We can roll along. And as soon as you're ready, you guys can shoot that flag up. I'm going to guess something. Jocks. I'm going to guess that it was Worlds 2017, and it was the misfortune. Um, no. Fuck. <laughs> keep revealing, keep revealing. Let's go. Oh my Moving God. forward. Oh! Oh! oh. Ah. It's, uh, when Faker gets caught by uh, Ruder with the flash board on Barrow. Yes! <laughs> yes! This iconic moment is, of course. Another flag! <laughs> it is. I'm That's why I myself. Ruler on Varus. We can you roll it, yeah. clip. This is a famous, famous clip. Game three of the finals. Ruler flashes Ooh. forward, catches Faker, and this, of course, leads to the end and Ruler's World Championship back wow. in 2017. One of the most iconic moments. Such good storytelling. You're going to remember that one. We have one more question here yeah. now. So final question. We've just reminded you how Ruler won World 2017, but when did he actually win his first domestic title? <laughs> Emily. 2022. 2022 what? Oh, uh, <laughs> summer. Yes. <laughs> he won with Gen G 3-0 against T1 there. Oh, my God. So that that's a tiebreaker. Emily wins. Nice. So I think Congratulations. We can show the whiteboard here. 
I, th I can't remember if I put down the last question or not. I forgot to I, be honest with you. I think, uh, but this is what we're going with. I also have to apologize. Dagnat I think, three. Uh, Dagnat three. Between Rob and I, this is the first time we've ever swore on. Uh, you guys did really well. Yeah, I'm this, very is, sorry. this is a close and <laughs> yeah. competitive game. Yes. Never happened. I'm very I, proud I of all of you. I might have whispered an F bomb. Yeah. In there. You, can, you can also tell not competitive at all. That's no, why no, they were no. swearing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just insane because we've been part of so many of these important matchups, and sometimes it's it's hard to get all the historical ones. Like it is really hard. I would have gotten mo almost all these wrong. They are it's hard insane. questions. And you know what? I think we're going to get a lot more quiz questions as a consequence of the matchup we have today because the primer was all fun and games, but let's get into it. JDG versus T1, the last hope of the LCK versus the team on the Golden Road for a spot in the World's Finals. And let's start with JDG. How impressive they have been all year long on that Golden Road. And let's remind ourselves that at MSI, they had T1's number. Yeah, I think for JDG, this is a team that has been built to succeed and they've been doing just that. The fact that you had a meta at MSI that allowed them to play heavily around Ruler, play into those team fights, have things like the Lulu and that Enchanted support meta to prop up this insane AD carry has lent them that strength to become the best team fighting team in the world. But as we see the meta start to change, I think this is where JDG have to try and show their stuff. Yeah, I can't stress enough what a meta shift this was that happened at MSI because we came in with T1 heavily favored due to the pushing bot lane 2v2 meta. It was Karia who was kind of dictating the global support meta before this. And like you said, being able to play these massive 5v5 team fighting comps around Ruler on a hyper carry was what propelled JDG to this title. And I think the fact that we've seen JDG grow as a unit together has been absolutely incredible. When you look back at 369, who is never a big engage and team fighting player, playing to that strength. Kanavi having to change his style from carry to support. It has been a transition that has been incredible to see, and now it's producing world-class results. And Azale, when you are on that golden road, you know, we've talked about it already, mm -hmm. has JDG had to adapt to too much? MSI reminded us to, yes, in fact. But now again, we're in a situation that perhaps they find themselves in a completely different meta best of five. Absolutely, and that's the thing. T1 has also been the LPL killers at Worlds, and this is going to be another massive hurdle for them because T1 historically has done great against the LPL, and JDG, they are the big dogs. They are the team on the Golden Road that everyone is thinking about how can we take them long? And one of the criticisms of their run has been that the meta hasn't changed. It's not that impressive. You played the same way all year long. Well, guess what? The meta is changing here. The meta is changing now. And I think the meta favors T1. So JDG have a Titan to overcome today. I think it's going to be a very, very tough road for JDG, but I think it's kind of underestimating the strength of how good JDG has been for so long. And I think if you can control that bot lane and control the 2v2, I think that's going to be the success where you can then lean into those team fights later. Well, let's lean into kind of how we see this matchup a little bit, because I feel like everyone was convinced and has been convinced the entire year. I think you tweeted it also yeah. that JDG should be head and shoulders above anyone else. But what is it that happened in that T1 versus LNG series that makes us look at everything so differently? I mean, I think it started with Weibo and with Chris being the priority mm -hmm. on these Enchanter bot yeah. lanes. And it started this arms race where people say, all right, well, if you're going to be blinding or an auto win bot lane, well, what if I play Ash support? What if I play Kalista plus a Caitlyn? What if I play something that can beat even that? And Karia is the most flexible support player at this level in the entire world. And that has given T1, I think, such a leg up because no one can predict what they can do. And they're the one team that has made red side look so damn strong, which is a massive advantage in this event. This is a good primer. We're going to dive deeper into it in, in a second. But as you mentioned, that bot lane, we need to talk about Ruler as well for JDG and Faker versus Ruler, arguably the two best players who ever touched the game. And the fact, Emily, that both of these have been on top for so long. Yeah, and we talked about how, like, Ruler just got his first domestic title, uh, not this summer, but last yeah. summer, um, which was a big hurdle for him to overcome, right? Because Faker has been so consistently good. Like, this is over such a long time for both these players, starting pretty much as soon as they could possibly debut when they were age eligible. Obviously, Faker a little bit younger when he started because we didn't have the 17-year-old, uh, like, rule? You know, yeah, rule at the point. Um, but this is them in their head-to-head. -head. And it's interesting because you would think because Faker has just been so domestically dominant in all of these um, events with T1, 
It was, I, I was actually really surprised to see how close it is over such mm -hmm. a long stretch of time. And one of the things that impressed me so much, I recently did a ranking of some of the best team fights of all time. And watching back, there was one from 2017 and one from 2023, both with Ruler 1v9. <laughs> and it really blows your mind, not only how long these players have been around, but how long they have been at the absolute top mm -hmm. of the game. It is really something incredible to behold. I think it is a bit of a different story for both sides, though. For Faker, it felt like he had to adapt to the the upcoming challenges. He had to change uh, how he wanted to play as a, a player to become the big brother for the new T1 roster that we see today versus the old carry performance. Whereas when you look at Ruler, he just had to be the best AD in the world. Yeah. It's easy. <laughs> and then he just needed a team that could support him, be the best in the world to support him, right? And I mean, you see it there on the screen. The last time we saw these two players face off against each other, it was Ruler who came out on top in that 2017 final to win his first world championship. And now we're going to get to see them go head to head here again today. Yeah, at Worlds indeed, and Worlds 2016 and 17. So pivotal in this rivalry and today is going to be as well but on the way to his fourth world's title possibly it is faker but he has to face none other than the reigning msi champion knight in our featured matchup presented by mercedes-benz today's featured matchup presented by mercedes-benz hails the clash of two league of legends icons faker the unkillable demon king against knight the golden left hand Faker is on the hunt for his fourth world title, this time seeking to claim it on the very soil that crafted his legend. Coming back from an injury and with an unrivaled record against LPL teams, Faker and T1 are the shining last hope of the LCK. But on the other side stands Knight, the mastermind behind JDG's Golden Road. Well, Ruler wants to try to show the shockwave is massive on the BDD. Crowned at MSI and now at the peak of his powers. Surrounded by a constellation of superstars, he's poised to carve the path to his first world final. At MSI, we bore witness to their epic five game saga. Yeah, yeah, these twin fangs just layering on top of Vega Knight is going to go down. Now, the stage is set for a rematch to seal their fates. Will Faker solidify his legend on home soil, or will Knight etch his name at the pinnacle of world's history? And I can't stress how domestically dominant Knight has been, like pretty much since his debut, obviously. Um, there's this really weird and in my opinion, specious choking narrative around Knight at uh, international events, which hopefully has been put to rest. But Knight has been such a phenomenal mid laner since he was on Young Miracles. People were really looking forward to his debut in the LPL. He's called the golden left hand by the Chinese <laughs> casters because he's left handed. And I mean, I, I guess I just can't stress enough because if you don't watch the LPL, you might not have an idea of just how incredibly good this player is. I mean, when I look at him, I think he's the most clutch player in the world at the moment. When you look at what he's done domestically, where you can look and go, right, there's the first ever time he ever won that title, the Syndra play to set him up for success. When you see him going 2v4 with Jackie Look, quirky package into the Baron pit to get a quadra kill and turn that game around. Hold the Nexus two versus five yep. as Silas to keep his team in the game. This guy steps up time and time again. And we're finally getting to see it at the international stage as well against teams like KT. Knight is a force to be reckoned with, and he's going to be going up against what feels like an immovable object here today in Faker. I just wish that me choking would equate to winning an LPL spring, <laughs> winning MSI, winning LPL summer, and then making Worlds uh, semis. That sounds like a pretty good choke. <laughs> I agree. Uh, this is, um, yeah, just from this tournament as well. Uh, it's been insane, and it's interesting because I think you know, when we talk about Faker, we have to take into regard kind of, we know his stature when you look at the historical angle of things, but kind of how things went this year, the injury, right? Mm -hmm. um, the fact that he took time to get over that, the fact that his champion pool wasn't as wide, of course, because he had to really focus on getting those Silas and the Azir and the Orianna on point to make sure that he had a base. How much is that going to come into play today? I mean, I think the big thing for Faker is that he looked, first of all, he looked great against Scout in LNG. And obviously, you can also pin a lot of that on the fact that LNG had a really poor performance. But I thought he looked absolutely great in that series. And then additionally, I think you... If you can't understate how good Knight is, like, mechanically, right, and how domestically dominant he's been, you can't understate not only how domestically dominant Faker has been in his entire career, but also 
as you pointed out earlier, Dagda, how flexible he's had to be to stay at the level, and also how lost the team looked without him this summer. Exactly. I think that gave people such a renewed appreciation for Faker and what he does for this organization, because even if, as an individual, he's not crushing lanes at the elite level in the same way that he used to, he brings so much to the table. He does, and especially that series versus LNG opened many people's eyes, maybe notably also about the picks in the bot lane. And I want to talk about the support specifically. We have Missing versus Caria in this one. And there's been so much talk about kind of the innovation of the bot lane meta over Worlds. And a lot was credited to T1, but actually started a bit earlier. Yeah, it did start a little bit earlier where we actually got to see the things like the Renata coming out for Weibo, where they started to transition into, hey, we want to play these more supportive roles. And you can see that's one of the champions that's in that shared champion pool between these two supports. But I think when we look at Missing, he much more prefers to go towards things that are the engaged, the playmaking champions, and set up for his team. Like, he made his name on Fresh in the LPL. Now he's playing things like the Rakan, where he has he's 31 and 3 over the course of this year. He wants to be that big setup for the team and pop off. And I think he's done a fantastic job. Like, this is a guy who missed out on Worlds 2022 because they end up losing five series back to back. But even back then, he was an incredible player that nearly got his opportunity. And now we get to see him take into the world stage with the likes of Ruler to try and play for the 2v2 and bot, bully you out of lane, and then bully you out of team fights as well. Yeah, and I mean, I think you can see just how instrumental his engages are on, obviously on the Rakan, but also on other engaged champions, how it lends itself to JDG's team fighting and how they layer their CC and fight together. I also will say, you know, Karia obviously is going to, he has dictated the support meta this past spring. Missing was actually 100% win rate on Ash in LPL in spring. So like it's not like he cannot play some of these lane dominant champions as well. Absolutely, but I do expect coming into today that it's going to be those kind of two polar opposites, right? I think JDG are going to play more standard and it's going to be can they play defensive? Can they withhold the storm, you know, survive that early onslaught from what would likely be a lane dominant 2v2 from T1. And if they can, those types of lanes become very fragile if you're not playing from a lead. You make one misstep, you get blown out in the 5v5, all of a sudden, Ash support looks like garbage. Yeah, and that is the big question, right? Because you're going up against Missing and Ruler, and that is not anything like any other bot lane in the world. And let's not be mistaken, they, they can play through these very difficult lanes. No matter what happens, they will step up to carry in the mid game. So do we think that the difference that T1 can make in that bot lane will be big enough? It's going to be actually super interesting, right? Because I agree with Azale. I think both teams are going to come and try to play the playstyle that they are more comfortable with, with JDG going for mid to late game team fights and T1 going for these incredibly dominant, double, possibly double ADC pushing bot lanes. I do think there is no better team than T1 at taking these laning leads and spreading the influence around the map, right? Like when you look at how they play something like a Caitlyn or a Varus Ash, they know exactly when to get out of lane and rotate to take all of the tier one turrets down like you are supposed to. That's where teams kind of mess up a little bit, I think, and not pressuring their influences. But then JDG are incredible at capitalizing on their opponent's mistakes and also love these mid to like mid to late team fights where they can set up for massive 5v5. Uh, sorry, we need to go to <laughs> Emily's Telestrator because we're running out of time. We have too much to talk about. What are you going to show us? All right, so I'm going to show how T1 kind of plays around their bot lane a little bit and just has a really good understanding of what they want to do. So in this, they've actually already had um, pinged out Tarzan, when he dropped a flag up in um, Telestrator is not responding to me. Yep. That's unfortunate. Oh, it's the grind, the glory. Yeah, I that's know. what it's all for. <laughs> is it coming back? Let's see. Yeah. There we go. Okay. There we okay. Go. So yeah, basically T1 are like, okay, we want to be able to get this bot lane ahead. And what they're going to do is go for an invade here. They're going to get a ward right on red. And they're going to be able to track Tarzan really, really well across this entire game. They're going to invade on Raptor Camp. They're going to be able to go and get blue. And then this is in their second game. Again, they really want to snowball around this bot lane and play around it. And this honestly ends up being awful for Hong, right? Because as you actually pointed out on cast as ill when this happened, he's going to have to start W, which not only is this lane incredibly difficult to deal with, but he's also st not starting exactly no how he would start. want. Yeah, and that's massive to try to go up against what is already a difficult lane in the Varus Ash. And now we're going to see that 
Faker is actually going to place a ward here. And it's just a lot of really, really smart um, tracking of Tarzan, where he is, what they can do around the massive, massive push that T1 have in this bottom lane down here with the wave coming in. And also, you you can't like underestimate how much um, this Hawk Shock matters as well to try to track. Owner is able to invade uh, on the top side of the map here. He's able to help essentially set this lane, Glow Scout's Flash again super early in this game. So I think I really do credit, obviously Owner had a really, really rough summer, right? And he has looked so much better in this tournament and has had such a good reaction to T1's tracking of their enemy jungles and being able to play around their pushing bot lane. Absolutely, and I think the question is, you know, can JG prepare for that, right? Because yeah. they have now seen yeah. this series, they have now watched exactly what T1 wants to do, and now it's up to them to be able to deny this aggressive vision, to be able to craft a plan that is going to be able to answer this and shut down T1's win conditions. And I think the thing is, if Kanavi can't play off of pushing lanes, he starts to fall apart as well. So this bot lane becomes even more crucial in that regard as well. Oh, it's so interesting how this matchup, who we thought we would see at some point in time at Worlds, has warped so much because of the recent evolution, and still it's about who is the best team on the day and if you're not your road ends here and specifically for T1 and the current roster that is so poignant in terms of also how they've come out openly to say this might be the last time you see us in this iteration mm -hmm. so what if not worlds I mean it would be heartbreaking because they've been so close so many times to that international title we've seen it at MSI we've seen it at worlds they're clearly capable of winning that title and for them to have never done it and break up I think would just be truly heartbreaking for all the T1 fans yeah, I mean, I think the, the big thing is, again, we talk about how good this team has been over the, the time that they've been together, but the thing that has eluded them and they've entered tournaments as heavy favorites is that international title. So it does cast like, okay, is this the best team of the past two years? Because they still haven't won internationally. Yes, yeah, so and that is what is uh, in their eyes when they're stepping up on the stage. And they're up against a JDG who is so successful already and so feared and revered, but the Golden Road is still going. They still have to win those two matches, starting with the one today. And I think for JDG, a lot of people are kind of underestimating them because they came across KT where they're like, they had this slow early game, but this has always kind of been the way with JDG. They're not a team that's going to suddenly explode onto the rift and not just destroy you. It's a case of, hey, we're going to play it slow, we're going to play to punish mistakes, and we're going to play to take over in those team fights. And that has been the slow and steady win case for them over and over again. And when you look at this team as a whole, like in their history, JDG has been a team that since 2020 has been building to become this monster in League of Legends. You look at them picking up players like Zoom, they want <laughs> to try and play for these big uh, team fight wins, but slowly but surely they've been adding to that roster keeping Kanavi as their core, adding the pieces that they needed. Now they've got one of the best, if not the best AD carry in the world. The best, if not one of the best mid laners in the world. This is a team that wants to take over and they're looking to do it here today. They are. They even got tattoos just now <laughs> for the moment. That's crazy. Let's take a look at who our fans predicted to win in our MasterCard fan predictions each day. You can head over to at MasterCardGG on X to participate. And uh, I got a little spoiler. It's, it's kind of crazy. T1. T1 with 75.2%. The most popular team in the world. It's true. Yeah. By a mile. Yeah, uh, it makes sense. It tracks in terms of the fandom, right? But as always, maybe it doesn't uh, accurately represent what we are going to see today. So I'd love to know from my analysts, who do you think will win? Who will win and play Weibo next week in the World Final? Well, I thought that JDG was going to win Spring. They won Spring. I thought that JDG was going to win MSI, and they won MSI. I thought that JDG was going to win Summer. They did that, too. And coming into Worlds, I thought it was going to be JDG winning Worlds. But the more that I've watched the meta develop, the more that I've seen T1 play, the more that I think this is the perfect time for their title they've been searching for all these years to finally come to fruition. So to today, it's going to be T1 win. It's going to be T1 making it to the finals. I got I just can't see it. I think the LPL gets eyes. underrated <laughs> so often coming into these events where they think, oh, well, BLG can't beat Gen G. We see teams, oh, well, they can't beat them at MSI. The LPL has proven at this tournament as well that they are the best region here, and JDG are going to prove it again 3-1. Ooh, wow. Oh. Love it. Okay. Emily. Really quick. I said 3 gt one Okay. Uh, mainly because uh, to a lot of stuff that Azale already covered, the way that the meta has shifted at MSI shifted in JDG's favor. I think the way the meta is shifting now is shifting heavily into T1's favor. This is what they've been waiting for. They're going to do it. 
And there's so uh, something that is uh, hard to quantify, but easy to notice if you are in the arena like we are right now. And it's the amount of fans that have congregated here in Busan that have filled up all the seats and that are looking for the final hope of the LCK to do it. With Weibo Gaming waiting next Sunday, the stage is set for an epic semifinals today. JDG could become the most successful team in the history of League of Legends by completing the Golden Road. But in their way today is the pride of the LCK T1. Who will take the final step to Seoul and which story will end here in ice cold Busan? Castrogen, take it away.
왕의 그림이라고도 불리는 작품입니다. 왕이 어디를 가든 항상 왕의 뒷배경을 차지했던 그림입니다. 이 그림은 아직 미완성입니다. 왕이 비로소 앞에 앉아야만 그 그림이 완성이 된다고 하죠. 2016년 베이코의 마지막 월드 우승이었습니다. 상대는 다름 아닌 룰러였죠. 2017년 패배를 잊고 다시 일어선 룰러는 끝나지 않을 것 같았던 T1의 황금기에 막을 내립니다. 그때도 약간 SKT라는 팀 자체가 몇 단계 더 위에 있다고 라 많이 느꼈었는데 페이커 선수는 높은 곳에 올라가려면 늘 마주해야 하는 벽 같은 존재였었어요. 그때 페이커 선수를 꺾고 트로피를 들었을 때는 세상에 있는 거다 가진 기분? 내가 주인공이 됐다라는 생각을 많이 가졌었어요. 안 좋은 영향도 많이 줬었다고 생각을 합니다. 오만함, 자만심도 많이 있었던 것 같고 무조건 우승해야겠다는 생각 때문에 좀더 저를 잡아먹었던 것 같아요, 제 자신은. 블러 선수가 상영이 형, 페이커 선수한테 한번큰 상처를 줬기 때문에 상영이 형을 도와서 룰러 선수를 이길 수 있다면 좋을 것 같습니다. 다들 룰러 선수를 어떻게 막을 거냐고 물어보시던데 막는 게 아니고 드셔버리도록 하겠습니다. 
진도 아직 아무도 이루지 못한 골든 로드 달성에 한 발자국 더 가까워졌습니다. 2017년에 그때보다 마인드가 많이 바뀌었다 생각한 게 운명이 이끄는 대로 최선을 다하면 높은 곳까지 올라갈 수 있다고 생각합니다. 그들의 앞엔 아직 넘어서야 할 산이 있습니다. 저희가 갈 길은 이미 정해져 있습니다. 룰루아 선수 잊지 말아야 할 겁니다. 모든 길은 결국 저를 통합니다. 오랫동안 수많은 팀의 상승과 하락을 지켜봤습니다. 끝에 서 있던 사람은 항상 저입니다. 이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이
you do, but of course we have to see how JDG are going to approach this bot lane arms race. What they're going to bring to the table to try to shut down some of these options for T1. T1 dominant on the red side, one of the only teams to do so. JDG have the luxury of that last pick, counter pick for bottom lane. How will they use it to number one question on Renata's still up, Milio still up, the Varus was very good for Gumiyushi. And what I'm wondering about is whether we are going to see the Zaya, because I think particularly into Rumble, Zaya has really dropped in stock, becomes very hard to play out the late game fights when you have to use your Feather Storm immediately. But for JDG, that doesn't apply. Ruler is an absolute insane Zaya, uh, courtesy of his uh, world skin as well. So no surprise if it is locked in here. And it would also mean that T1 might be going towards the hyper carry themselves. Have to see how T1 want to round out this, how they want to respond, what they want to blind pick into this bot lane support matchup. Because I love what I'm seeing from JDG. So much backline threat with the Rumble Alt, the Akali, the Vi going in together, having AD carry, who can oh, peel for themselves. We were talking Jin about Bart! We, were, we were talking about the Jin so much early in the morning, and he actually slams it. Kubo loves the Jin. So many people who are not AD carry players, though, do not like this tank. Do you, yeah, do you I, will say, I will say, I will say, calm down a little bit here. There is no tank on the enemy team, and that is the biggest inhibitor to the Jin. So as much as, as everybody loves memeing on Jin picks, there is no armor stacking tank here, but that's the biggest problem that he has to deal with. There's a lot of history, obviously, uh, with Jin and T1. None of it good, and it is also a really big pivot away. I think the laning strength is the only similarity, but outside of that, not really going to be the case. The Alistair actually coming back here does mean that Missing will be able to provide engage. And I really like this. I feel like you kind of need to have some extra form of CC here besides the Vi to really get the most out of your Rumble in particular. Yeah, for sure. They always want to have that structure to their team fights because JG is the team. They do not snowball game super effectively. They just crush you later in the team fights. Let's see if they can actually do it this time around. Of course, this is the first gin of Worlds 2023 picked up here. Guma slamming it down in the semifinals. And there's so much CC with this bottom lane as well. So much pick potential with a Bard plus Jin. You can try and get that early lead in lane against an Alistar and then get Karia out of lane so you can go gank for the other lanes. And we saw yesterday how effective a roaming Bard can be, how disruptive it can be to the game plan. A lot of the champions on the opposite side who might want to roam, who might want to look for these plays. You are up against missing on Aust or this massive playmaker. So need to see if T1 can continue the trend of snowballing their leads in the early game. And Kerry has already proven himself on the Bard at Worlds here. He had a really beautiful uh, Q flash redirection play on it. He's been very good at denying uh, the Rift Trail charges as well on the tower. So expecting big things. It also means the top lane matchup is much more important. With Jing comes, you can't really afford to lose damage elsewhere. And we have not seen this matchup work out very well for the Aatrox. So a lot of pressure here on Zayas, who has been doing a really good job so far. But Rumble, that's going to be tough to survive in the early game. So one thing I was talking about yesterday on the analyst desk with the Aatrox into the Rumble pick was that we did not get the uh, Comet Aatrox. It was Conqueror Aatrox. And if you go Comet Aatrox, it's much more of a poke playstyle. But I also was DMing Odo and talking about it. <laughs> he was really heavy on the Rumble side. And he was of the opinion that Rumble still can just W most of the Q poke, even with the, uh, the Comet build here, and still come out ahead. And then you're sacrificing. Of course, you don't have Conqueror for later for the Aatrox for your team fights. And uh, we'll see how much that does cost them. But Zeos here at least is going for the Comet tech to try and do that more pokey play style. We'll see how it works out for them. Of course, in the meantime, connect your League of Legends account with Prime Gaming to grab the exclusive Braum W emote. That's how I felt about the Aatrox in the Rumble matchup yesterday. A lot of Braum W. So see if it works out better this time around for Zeus. How the poke adjusts this match if it can shift these early expectations. And Jin, I think, is going to remain the number one question throughout this entire game. How effective can it be? Ruler obviously opting for the cleanse makes sense against so much CC, but what can they do in the early laning phase specifically? And those early lane phase, what we expect them to be is to be a lot of push mid for Faker against this Akali. Knight Akali, early levels, you're not going to have uh, too many options there. So the Orianna generally going to get some push. JDG with 369 on top side, the Rumble should still uh, get plenty of push versus the Aatrox regardless of the Comet. So I want to see what they do with this because T1, you can see, owner is already taking away uh, Raptors into red camp, started on the top side, doing a bit of split for the jungle. And that is going to be two camps stolen already. And Bard level one still looking incredibly oppressive with your passive. You essentially have two spells early on, whereas Missing essentially has none as a level one Alistair. 
So no surprise to see T1 take control of the bottom lane for now. See what it looks like once level 2 comes around for now. Karia and Guma doing their best to zone JDG's bot lane off of XP and gold. Also, do take note, we already have Owner possibly looking for an opportunity to punish Free 6 9 He did walk into the jungle, didn't actually see, I think, where Owner started. We'll obviously find it out soon, as soon as Kanavi gank. figures it out. But the timing window might just be there. It's perfect for the setup. Three, six, now nine. they know! Total control of the lane, but just now sees Owner. Owner mounting up. On the way in, looking to lock him up and take him out. 369 still standing for now. Will he burn the flasher or just accept his fate? Trying instead to turn and burn on Zayas, get a little bit more health damage. Just accepts his fate. First blood for the side of T1. Knight and Kanavi not able to find the counter punch in mid lane. Level ones are so big, and the delayed invade there, taking away the Raptors into red. Easy level three top side counter gank. Or just pure gank there for owner. Meanwhile, Kanavi getting chased off his attempted counter jungle. Oh, Faker trying to make sure that Kanavi does not just get the camp for free. Now, Owner's on his way, and Karia, he's trying to collapse. Karia coming through. Magical journey through the wall will just completely zone him off the camp. Defense complete. And now Kanavi is going to know he's got nothing to go back to in his own jungle. Even gets stunned up here in mid lane by Karia, further delaying him. Everybody knows, T1 know his only option is to come topside towards a scuttle crab or towards... Uh, some more blue camps here. So it looks like owner comes up. He covers that top scuttle crab and there is nothing for Kanavi. Not only that, but owner already has been able to get a back in, whereas Kanavi still had to be out on the map trying to pivot. And this timing window was so short because you see Kanavi there pinging. They know that owner is on the top side of the map. 369 just wasn't able to get the wave in in time. And, and the key is this ward right here that they had to see the, the regular gank path is all circumvented by that level one that we're talking about. When he starts on Raptors, goes into red, he just three camp clears JDG's side of the jungle, comes from behind you with a red buff, and that is going to influence the data on our Aatrox Rumble matchup a little Certainly bit is. Further. And you got to respect T1's foresight to prepare for what is uh, considered a Rumble favored matchup by leveraging some early jungle priority here to the top side of the map. Zayas getting closer and closer to what we assume is the first item Hex Drinker. We saw in the Gwen matchup how impactful that item is in the 1v1. You know what they say? The most important part of a top lane matchup is jungle. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> no fair fights in the top lane. Also, do know Zayas went for Doran's Blade, so really opting in into the early lane dominance, in addition to the kill that he already got, doesn't really set him behind, does give him a lot more combat stats to try and stay on parity. Because if you can mitigate the rumble early on, it gets you to the point where the Aatrox can actually skirmish. And as already mentioned, I do expect it to be a Hexdrinker, given that you're playing to double AP topside, and T1 have been very aggressive in securing early Heralds. It's five minutes into the game. T1 already have a 1,000 gold lead. No objectives taken quite yet. Herald, of course, hasn't even spawned. But T1, we expected them to pull ahead in the laning phase, but they are much further than just a little bit ahead at this stage of the game. Yeah, it's so interesting and fun to compare the playstyle of these two juggernaut teams. Absolute masters here at Worlds in very different arenas. T1, masters of snowballing these lane phases into mid game and into end of the entire Nexus. Meanwhile, JDG, they have not put a lot of effort in a lot of their games into getting huge early leads, but they have been explosive in their mid game team fights and actually have a quicker average game time because of it. Oh, and I would really, really like this from JDG, because you know T1 is going to try and aggressively stack dragons, but they won't have the opportunity. We do see Knight already here. Doesn't look like T1 is going to be able to contest the streak Zeus of going for the solo bolo, and he just gets the kill! What? That is, that is not a Comet diff right there. That's a Zeus diff. God of lightning, God of the top lane. He lays it down, and 369 it is in the dirt again. Whoa! And for T1, after the chase performance we saw last week, we wondered what level Zayas would be at, what level C69 would be at in this matchup. When he got the rumble, I thought for sure he'd be favored, but Zayas setting the expectation on its head, and 369 just too far behind, stepping far nice. too far forward. Yeah. Q1 uh, confirms the pullback on Infernal Chains, makes it easy. Yeah, just dash forward, hits the chain. He had the level 6 advantage, gets the solo bolo. And again, it all comes back to the early jungle path for Kanavi, stealing away, or for our owner, stealing away the camps, getting the gank off. Because if 369 is 6, you can't go for that play, right? He, he will be able to easily survive as... Ruler ignited, two fights, one in the bottom lane, one in the mid lane, Faker burning the shockwave just to get away from Knight. Now the curtain call coming out, Ruler. 
Gonna sidestep one, slowed by the second, looking for one more, but missing there just in time to deny the kill. Guma Force shot now pushing in. Jin notoriously bad at pushing these towers. Probably not gonna be able to grab a plate there, but Ruler's so low, maybe they can get it done. Is owner still controlling? Total control on the top side from T1. Mid lane matchup Guma? getting a bit closer. Guma playing very aggressive with the power of the journey. See there as well, the confidence from Ruler, knowing that Missing was there, not using his flash. Only invested its cleanse, but T1 still gonna be happy there towards the bot side of the map. I think the big thing for JDG is to not let the map snowball from here. That early Drake actually makes a really big difference because we know this team is going to play for, say, one, two item spikes and the 5v5. So delaying the point where T1 forces you into a must fight scenario with Drake stacking early on has already been delayed. And then secondly, Knight has been able to do a really good job of mitigating the early presence that Orion is expected to have by just staying on CS parity. I have to say, especially with the early money oh. and being behind, the early money going into Oblivion Orb and being behind, this Rumble is not going to have the same impact that we have seen Rumble at this tournament. Those, those team fight ultimates that he is supposed to bring for these objectives are going to be so much weaker than you're used to seeing. I don't know if the threat is even going to really be there for JDG, so a T1 are going to feel very confident about this mid game and try and snowball here. Owner up to the top side does see Kanavi as he comes over with that Scryer's plant, but they're calling up everybody here. This is going to be a full five on five. Both bot lanes coming. No ultimates available for either support. There are ultimates for both Ruler and Guma. We'll nope. see if T1 is able to contest here. No flash for Karia. Has to be a bit careful about how far forward he steps. Kanavi ready with the ultimate. Zayo's strong. Getting low. But opted for Lethality. He's still relatively squishy, all things considered. Zayo still stepping forward with the Infernal Chain. Looking for the lockup. Tempered Fate now coming in. Isolating Knight. Knight right in the back line. And owner immediately with the follow-up. Engage. Zayo still standing. Now finally the buy is going in, but it might just be too little too late. Knight. Oh, Fancy V to the back of the fight. Burn. Zayus ticking, burning, but the shutdown is three, six, nine. over the back of the pit and then still chase down two of the kills. That initiation, Caria barred ultimate into owner, timing the rel engage right afterward is massive. And the nightmare of the Jin turns into a dream for T1 fans as this Herald fight goes their way. It is the setup here initially, it looks a bit clunky, but owner gets the combo, immediately forces out the ult from ruler, and this is where, if 369 isn't so far behind, maybe it's enough to turn the fight, but instead, everyone is already low, the equalizer isn't enough, and JDG are fishing a barrel. And you just saw there, Rumble flashed and still died. Gumiushi killed him. Missing flashes, missing still gonna die. He gets killed by the Jin again. Karia. Bar tunnels them over, Knight dies as well. Let's see about the next fight because now there are going to be zero flashes on the side of JDG. Faker oh, and still have theirs. Zeus, no boots yet, no oh, magic flash. mantle. Working steadily towards what we assume will be a Dusk Blade here as he backs away. Maybe suspects the play from Kanavi. Charge forward, lock up, ulti used in the previous fight. 369 still burning him down. Zayo's running for the hills, the rumble, Boom. and the buy. Get it done on the top side. A bit of hope for JDG. That's huge. That's very, very big for getting him back on trap. They need to get 369 and turret plate up there as well. Rift Trail dropped in the mid lane. Looks like Knight was actually the one who got to pick it up. Nice. So he's going to be able to get the full gold on it. Didn't have to split it with Kanavi there. Isolates it a little bit more, but next dragon coming up pretty soon as well. Only 10 seconds left on that clock. And Kerry is already trying to get a little bit deeper vision for the setup. Great big moment here. These are the types of plays that JDG need to make if they want to make sure that this goalie doesn't grow further, right? Shutting down Zay is not allowing him to just play the isolated 1v1 because we've seen in the series against LNG where that can lead. Kanavi being very patient there. Zayus walks up and wards, gets taken out even without the ult being available for the Vi. And reminder that when we talk about JDG, we talk about scaling graciously, being willing to lose something here or there. So when they hit two items, Items, they can find the perfect angle for a fight, something they are so incredibly good at doing. That said, T1 taking control for so much of this early game, almost 2k in their favor. They're not willing Dragon. to give up this Drake for free. Owner into the pit, and he will steal it right out of Kanavi's hands. Curtain call over the wall. There is nowhere for that buy to go. Guma now on a killing spree, missing, running for his life. Locked up into the wall. Equalizer used just to keep the support alive.
G1 make it look effortless there. They just come in, yoink, thank you so much for the dragon. Owner steals it away, and they also get oh the... No. Never mind, oh he no. gets a freebie back. Staying a bit too long. Stun now coming through. 369, careful not to overheat too quickly. Continuing to walk forward, making sure now he has the flames better to try to bring it back. Shockwave there, Carrier not quite able to connect. Maybe they have the damage. Faker's gonna be in trouble missing now, pushing him back, trying to sacrifice. Oh. 369 burns down to the ignite of Carrier. Missing, killed as well in every play that looks like it favors JDG. Just turns in the favor of T1. And it looked there like Owner had overstepped, but the rest of the team is there to back him up. Faker can't keep him alive, but can stall for reinforcements to arrive. And the key factor here through it all, through all of this exciting fight, is that all these kills keep going to Faker and Gumiyushi, and they still have their flashes available. The T1 carries are in a huge position to carry. So 140-something HP it looked like there on the Dragon. On a Kanavi's early attempt, Owner just yoinks it. Thank you very much. Then they come in. They did invest Zeus's teleport there to get down, and you see towards the end of it, you had Knight teleport up top side on the Akali to go pick up that minion wave by the top turret, which is probably what Owner was thinking when he was like, okay, fine, I guess it's it's okay for me to go in here. In the end, on the chase down, they still end up getting the better of it here because with the Ignite on 369, they still get that kill and they get the kill on the missing. So even though Owner walks into the jungle and he goes down, it's a two for one for T1. I mean, I don't know how I feel about Jin in general, so, but 303 Jin with Swifties and a Storm Razor, I feel pretty damn good about, Kobe. And it's about when you pick it. You know, like we said in Champ Select, there's no pure big tank on the enemy team. Temper Fate stack there. A bunch of armor. Should be an easy fall. Now Carrier taking his time, waiting for the wall to try to line it up. He doesn't even need to! Zeus' damage is disgusting. And crucial there. Look at the timing on 369 Flash. Just a couple of seconds later, and he would have been able to flash that. Would have been fine, but T1 is targeting this top side so insanely heavy, and it all comes from Karyas Bard. And he's not done. Clean sidestep, nice backstep as well. Shattering strike, not going to connect. Ruler able to hold on to his life. Good footwork, missing there to cover and clear the way. But T1, sharks in the water, waiting for a single sign of blood from JDG. So fun to watch them play because they, after they get the kill on top side, they immediately shift everybody up towards this mid lane. Zeus is able to get the tower by himself as they push them back. And so, first tower bonus, look at that. 14 and a half minutes. We've already got objective bounties popping up on the side of JDG because of the gold lead that T1 have accrued. That is insane. And MasterCard lane economy snapshot is uh, gonna remind us just how crazy it is. That's dominance. If you didn't know what dominance looks like in the graph, that's it. Oh, uh, yeah. What's that 25 then, huh? Uh, I don't what's know. What's that called? It's kind of like a reverse <laughs> middle finger is kind of what's oh, going on whoa. here in this early game. <laughs> and that said, T1, they're a team that's loved around the world, right? They're heavy favorites in the vote. But coming into this tournament, JDG felt like clear winners. Felt like probably an easy golden road given the meta. But T1, you know, a chance for redemption for a roster that's come close so many times, and they're making good on all that faith from all the fans here in Busan showing up in game one. Kind of player from JDG. They know they can't contest because of the item discrepancy. So try and get maybe a, a kill towards the bot side of the map. Maybe pick up a bounty. Fingers should be able to shove in the turret here, but it is going to be the Herald going over this time around to T1. And this dragon stacking is going to become a really big part. I think the first Drake that JDG got is still something they're going to be super happy about because it denies a really early Ocean Soul because we haven't really talked about it yet, right? But T1 in particular, if they can reach a point where players like Zayus, even with this Lethality build, can just sustain for everything, it becomes really hard for JDG because their rumble is so far behind to actually have the damage output until you get to way later in the game to take down T1. One thing that's so cool about the T1 bottom lane here and then continuing to innovate on the world's meta is that with Jin and Bard, you have so many pick tools for the mid stages of the game. When you get towers down so early like this, it frees up a lot of space to go in. Room for Carrier to make uh, some picks here with the Bard ultimate, as well as Guma Yushi with these Ws, trying to root up behind anything that owner goes for. So when you're in a time window like this, where Zeus does have his teleport ready, you have to be so scared as JDG, because Zeus can just split push and then still teleport into the rest of the team towards his Dragon Spawn. There he comes. Now the curtain call comes out, isolating Kanavi. Carrier now on the follow, trying to take the jungle out before the Dragon comes alive. Ignite already burning down, Kanavi running. Half health. If T1 want to capitalize on this window, they're going to need to fight soon. And look at that. Zayus was able to push the wave all the way up. He teleports down to the bottom side. 
Now T1 have the minion wave crashing topside. They can push out mid, and they're threatening JDG on this team fight. Zeus on the flank, down bottom, in the tri brush. Harold already utilized. Gonna create some pressure, gonna break open mid lane at the very least. T1 already pulling ahead in the play. If they can get the Drake as well, it's everything. Owner waiting in the darkness. JDG, this is such a tough angle to fight from. Continuing to stay around, continuing to stick around, willing to give up so many resources. The crash in mid lane already happened from the Herald. The tower slowly but surely crashing. And rather breaking down now as Dragon still aggroed here. Carrier playing on the edge. Ruler going through the portal. Feathers fly, but to little effect as JDG just have to run the pullback over the wall. Now they're just trying to isolate and take out Zeus. Big golden that... flux for the side of JDG. Can they take the fall of fight? Already the equalizer burned. Carrier running through the magical journey. Everybody trying to get up, but Owner will be denied. Owner cannot find the escape, but it doesn't matter because T1 are there in time. Mystic trying to fire back. Gumiyushi out of ammo, desperately trying to reload, but here comes the Kunai. Here comes Knight to flash away to safety. Three shots left in the barrel. Manages to lock him down. Play on the edge, missing as he stepped Faker's to coming. far. Faker on the flank, no shockwave, a lot of help. Has to play careful here. Knight, no ultimate. Needs to make his way out of this one. The lock up there from Guma from so far away. Oh, no. Owner coming in, the pullback on the missing, trying not to stick around for too long. One taken down already. Knight now going in, trying oh. to turn it back. Guma says not today. Guma puts it right between his eyes as Knight goes for the kill. But Faker did so much work in this. He's able to get back to the tri brush. His shockwave bites in the space, and then he chases down the extra kill. And for a moment, it looks like what I can only imagine must have been a mistake with Ruler taking the gate there. Uh, JDG is almost able to take it around by immediately collapsing onto Zeus. Even with him investing his flash, he ends up going down, and that's a lot of gold. 41 gone right from the get-go. And that is the Akali ultimate, it is the Vi ultimate, and it's a bunch of tower dive damage. So then when Faker is able to teleport down and reposition here by the tri as well, his shockwave splits them, and then look, he just runs down Ruler while Knight and Missing are trying to chase Gumayushi. But Gumayushi, critical flash right there. He dodges the E from Knight. That is lethal. He's able to avoid this, and then Faker's able to chase them down. The W coming through from the Jin as well to root up Knight. And that's all she wrote. Owner poking around. He knows all he has to worry about is the Akali damage. They kill off the Alistar first. Even with that E landing, Guma takes him down. Four shot in the dancing grenade to finish the job. <laughs> Close fight. At the end of the day, we saw in the picture in picture as well, Ocean Drake does get picked up. Exactly. And what is that going to do for the game plan for this team? We saw before the Dragon even went down, the mid tower's down. All the goals that T1 wanted with this composition have been accomplished. They're opening up the map. They've taken away the dragon stacking possibilities from JDG, and they have the gold lead to snowball with. So now without these outer towers in mid and top here, T1 are going to continue to look for picks. Owner pushed back, contesting a bit of vision here as Guma tries to get mid priority. You can see Faker opting for a defensive build in the Akali. Knows that if he wants to go onto that side lane, he needs something like a Banshees to make sure he does not get picked off. Diligence in the itemization of T1. Locket as well coming out for Karia, just to make sure that it's that much harder to burst to Guma Yushi. And with JDG so far behind in so many positions, they might just not have enough damage to finish off these priority targets. Karia going in. Lineup not quite there, but the captive audience now coming through. Missing, trying to back up. Shockwave pulling back just to kill the Alistair, but they get to tier two as well. The range on this composition, baby. Look at those picks for T1. The cow is down, and they're going to get a free bottom tower. Look at the mini map. Zeus free to split push to his heart's content. The last outer tower. The defense is here for JDG crumbling. Carry a perfect predict on the Shuriken clip means the lockup is there on a night. He goes into the shroud. Kanabi ready to give his life to protect his mid laner. They're now going into the back line straight on Guma. Locked up with a temper fade. Doesn't quite connect to the Jin. Burns to the ground. JDG trying to hold on to hope, but here is Zeus. Here is the top laner right as they need him to crash down the pull back on the Infernal Chains. Ruler. Missing goes in, but he cannot find the edge. Ruler still stands, but he doesn't have the angle to attack. He doesn't have the angle into the fight. The Shroud will take Knight out to safety in T1. Stand strong despite the kill on Naguma. As long as T1 doesn't get anything though, you'll take that as JDG. That is a big shutdown going over. Guma actually going down there means that at the very least some gold will go into the pockets but you gotta imagine as soon as the baron is going to get started by t1 their take is an amazing but that has to be the next objective area there knows knight's gonna go for the e on his tumble backwards 
stuns him up, hits him. But here's a look at the encounter. It is so beautiful. Kanavi locking Guma up, and then they get the root from Ruler. He doesn't even get to move, and Guma Yushi is dead. Yeah, if Guma gets caught in the bard earl there, then he actually survives, right? It is the fact that he just barely, I think, got knocked out of it there at the end. Uh, and as a result, ends up going down. T1 tries to get more extra kills, but won't find it. But this is the real test for JDG. Even with the deficit, can they maybe find a big Wombo combo on top of a Rumble Ultimate when T1 goes for Nash? And a test for T1 to make sure that they can take this Baron cleanly or continue to push their advantage forward. So many teams, this is where it all gets thrown away around this massive objective. JDG though, continuing to just fish for picks on the side lane, not eager to force the 5v5. The deficit they're at, it makes a lot of sense. 7k gold advantage for the side of T1. People usually uh oh as we have Owner getting in some dangerous territory here. We'll walk away. Rumble's recalling right now, and Rumble doesn't have teleport. He's, he's Ignite Rumble, so there's no way they actually try and fight it. All right, JDG, they want to defend their vision, but they have to choose their moment. They're so far behind that now, if they lose another fight, then that will be Baron, and that will be the end of the game. That will be all that T1 need to end it. Big thing here, though, is that that ward isn't spotted uh, by the control ward, so there is a 100% knowledge for JDG whether or not T1 has actually started up the Baron. Oh, JDG can just sit there, bide their time. Missing walks forward, immediately forced to break the Unbreakable Will, or to pop the Unbreakable Will. That was an immediate cost of curse. Sorry for your <laughs> flash missing. <laughs> to be fair, there, he knew they at least weren't on Baron, even if he wasn't sure of anything else. T1 have started this one. Guma in the area, again, a slower Baron normally, but they're so far ahead with the G that it might not matter. TP from the Akali, Knight in the area now, T1 maybe just gonna fish for the pick here. Already got one advantage. Tempered Fade onto Kanavi is big, the lineup is there. Zayo's immediately gonna look to knock him down. Can they find it? Kanavi now going right back into Zayo's owner in the area. Big damage coming in for the Darken Blade. Missing on the backside, trying to buy some space for the Shockwave! It's clean! And in comes the curtain call! And it's Zayus wreaking havoc on all of JDG to finish the fight! JDG. That's a clean ace. That's got to be the game. I think they can push for the end. Halt construction on the Golden Road immediately. T1 have something to say about it. From start to finish, they have been in the driver's seat from the creative passing in the early game of Owner to shut seconds. down. 3 6 9. T1 have their eyes on the prize, and the prize alone. A spot in the finals, or at least one game closer. T1 showing up massive in this first game, missing in Kanavi. Should not be enough. The Nexus, lower and lower. T1 drawing first blood in this series. Well, well, well. Blue side, game one. Quite the flex here from T1. Pulling out the Jin Bard, snowballing incredibly effectively. And I still have to remember how this game first started with Owner getting a really good Raptor Steel into Red Steel into Krugs, level three ganking on the Rumble from behind. And that changed the whole story of how this top lane is gonna go. Zeus is then able to follow it up with a solo kill and T1 snowballed victory. And I have two questions. What is gonna happen to Rumble? The pick away didn't work and what side is JG gonna pick? Damn good questions. Let's see if the analyst desk got any answers for us as we send it over for the post game breakdown. Well, I think they have a lot of grievances um, about this game, if you look at it from JDG. Um, T1 taking just a brick out of that golden road for now and saying not so fast JDG, but in terms of kind of the opening game that LCK fans will have wished for, this was phenomenal out of T1. I yes. mean, this was crazy and the arena was just erupting every single little play. They kill a ward, they're going crazy. Woo! They get a bar <laughs> queue, they're going crazy. <laughs> and when they started rolling, this place was going nuts. I mean, when you were tossing to the game start, the camera was literally shaking on the yeah. ground because it was so loud in here. I mean, it was, and it wasn't even close. I mean, the T1 fans had a lot to celebrate over the course of that game. The early game, they snowballed that top lane super effectively. They took over in the team fights. This felt super T1 heavy, and I know we wanted to take a deeper dive into that initial play. Yeah, so earlier on the analyst desk, uh, when we started off, I talked about how Owner and T1 had a really good understanding of how they wanted to play out their drafts from level ones, right? Well, guess what? We got another <laughs> one, so I'm gonna go back to the Telestrator. Hope it doesn't troll me this time. Um, and the big thing here you can see is that 
we talked about, then they brought it up on cast, this Aatrox versus Rumble matchup. So they really, really want to put the Rumble behind, right? So the way they do this is that first they're going to come in, they're going to set up Vision in here, right at red, and then they're going to do almost a little delayed invade onto the Raptors. So owner is going to come in, he's going to go Raptors to red to Krugs, and then immediately into a topside gank for Zayus. And this sets up what was actually an incredibly rough topside for 369 because Zayus after this then gets a solo kill, I believe, at yep. about like six minutes. And he, this Aatrox was just massive in the rest of the game. And it was because of the XP advantage that he got off of, got off of that. He hit yeah. six first, the Rumble wasn't six, dies there with no TP, it's so rough. And we talked about how T1, you know, you at the top of the day did your Telestrator of how T1 sets up these level ones. And yep. I do think JDG coming into game two need to take a more defensive approach on their level ones, do line of scrimmage setup, cross the map, have defensive wards, just try to play a game from equity at level one. Yeah, and I think the fact that you had that Rumble then fall behind, and even the decision making, I think Kobe called it out in the cast to go for the early Oblivion Orb, meant that your Rumble didn't have enough. And then when we got to these fights, that they weren't actually able to really do particularly much. And I'm curious as to why JDG honestly decided to contest test a lot of these fights because it really felt like they were already behind. Why not cross map instead of just giving more gold to T1? I felt like JDG's read was that it doesn't get better for them because yeah. they're always going to lose the side lane when they're down a TP and they have the rumble behind. So I think their read was, we know we're losing. This may be a 10% chance, but that's better than playing the game slow. I will say I do can I can understand where that's coming from, but like when we get to this like third fight at the uh, sorry, the third the fight at the third dragon, that was a fight that JDG could have won, right? And I think it's about picking your battles there's throwing everything in the kitchen sink at what could be a potentially Hail Mary play, but if you can take a 70-30 versus a 90-10, what's the point of not going for the more optimal play, right? And especially when we look at what JDG has been so good at doing, it has been finding their moments. This isn't what JDG do. No, and I see that you're frustrated, right? Yeah. Because we want this to be the, both teams playing at the peak of their potential. But we know that T1, when they do get an early lead, you know, it's been their bread and butter. They are so good at transitioning that into a bigger lead, and they were given all the tools by JDG here. Yeah, I mean, I think the big thing is that if we're discussing what JDG did wrong in this game, it's that they really could have, and you see from some of these fights later on where it's like, oh, okay, if the money was a little bit more even, if this game was a little bit more even, JDG can take some of these fights. So in contesting a lot of these early objectives the way that they did, they actually ended up donating enough money to T1 that T1 are like, okay, we can go to every single objective, you have to contest us and we will win. Yes, and they did very convincingly in game one. We won't have the side selection in time, but I do want to talk about it. Yesterday, Blue um, won all five games. But in this, I feel like in watching this first game, you know, we talked so much about T1's meta read and all that, but it was wasn't anything out of the ordinary that made the advantages happen for T1. No, it didn't. I mean, it was standard play, but I will say the Bard and the and the Jin both worked out really well for them, yeah. so still playing that range support bot. But a lot of this game was just straight up Zayus, you know, playing really well with Owner, and Zayus just has been on a different level than most of the other top leaders in this tournament coming into it. I expected Bin in 369 to be among the top, to be among the best, and they just have not played to their regular level. They really haven't, and I think that's where I think Zayus has really shown is that not, I like we literally saw this matchup yesterday where yeah. people were like, oh, why are you picking the Aatrox into Rumble? It doesn't work out. Well, Zayus has just shown what you can do when you get that opportunity. It does when you get an early gank top side. Exactly. And then just yeah. run away blue with side, it. by the way. I will say, though, okay. this this is where I think T1 really can get an advantage because I think they are the best red side team remaining in the tournament. You're going to give them over to red side. You have to take blue, but maybe T1 just wins red anyway. Yeah, let's see if JDG has something else in the tank. I believe so. We're not going to write them off that easily, but it is T1 that strike first here in Busan. We'll be right back. Doesn't look like T1 is going to be able to contest the streets going for the solo ball, and he just gets the kill! Fire is going in, but it might just be too little too late night. Oh, Fancy V to the back of the fight. Zayas ticking, burning, but the shutdown is 3-6-9. But now they're just fish caught in the barrel, waiting on the slaughter of the curtain. To make his way out of this one. The lock up there from Guma from so far away. Oh, no. Owner coming in, the pullback on the missing, trying not to stick around for too long. One taken down already. Knight now going in, trying oh. to turn it back. Guma says not today.
new roommate to save money? Is that the plan? Say hi to Glenn from work. Yeah, I think I have a much better plan. We switched to my plan from Verizon. That is a good plan. Glenn. Get my plan starting at just $25 when you bring your own phones. Plus, save when you add perks like the Disney bundle. It's your Verizon. Red Bull gives you wings. Red Bull gives you wings.